we get started. Welcome to your second section. Uh, hello. Sorry. We're starting. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming on this snowy day. Um, this is our second section. Unfortunately, I brought, as uh, you may notice, I brought the wrong cable. So I get to see the laptop and you get to see the chalkboard again. But I am still going to try to record it for people who aren't here so you can actually see the recording. Um, I'm probably not going to do any coding up here that you can't see for you to watch offline. Um, I don't think, I think watching me type here and not seeing anything would not be very helpful for the majority of people. So there's a couple of things I want to talk about today. Um, one, uh, as always, if there's any questions, anything in the class, I want to answer those. There are some questions already. Um, two, I want to talk about the next project, which is implementing a shell and how to go about doing that. Um, the third is I want to go um, uh, talk about how to debug programs in C. I, I think some of you may have had some bugs in your code that you had to debug, and I want to talk about some strategies for doing that that can be helpful. Um, and then I was going to talk about uh, the next project deals with strings, and I was going to talk more about how to deal with strings in C. So we'll see how this goes. Um, Without my printed notes. So the first announcement is that homework one has been posted. It's on Moodle, courses.moodle.wisp.edu. And uh, I think there's five questions, which are all relatively short. And it asks you to basically submit one text file or a PDF with answers to all five questions. You can tell I'm new to Moodle because there's one big answer instead of five little answers, which I think would be the normal way of doing it. But uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, and it's due next Tuesday at the start of class. Um, and the reason for that is I would like to have it due early enough that uh, the TA or I can flip through the answers and see if there's problems to go over before the quiz, which will be next Wednesday in section. Any questions on the homework? There's not much to ask about, I guess. Um, so the second piece is the next um, project assignment. And again, I apologize for overlapping this because you probably don't want to think about it right now. Um, but as I said yesterday in class, the goal is really a shell, um, to write a command shell. So you'll write a command shell. It will print out a prompt, something like this. Uh, it will be interactive, so people can sit there and type in commands. You can say things like ls. And then a path name. And when this happens, it should do a fork. Execute the command here. And then uh, the shell should wait for the command to return. So the logic is fairly straightforward. There are two features that we add to it. Um, one is we're adding a uh, plus operator that says if you do two commands, this is like the ampersand in the normal Unix shell, but we rename it to make it harder, perhaps. Or so you can't just copy the Unix shell code and use it. Um, um, so what ls does is it says whatever command, sorry, what plus does, says whatever command precedes the plus should be run without waiting. Um, anything, any command that is not followed by a plus, does, uh, you have to wait for. So in this case, the shell would run ls without waiting, and then would run sleep and would wait for sleep to finish. There's also a There's also a semicolon operator which says run a sequence of things in order. This says run the L. If you put ls semicolon sleep, it says run ls, wait, then run sleep. So um, it's like plus, but um, it's a wait instead. You can use the two of these together. So here I have ls semicolon sleep plus cat foo. 
uh, kind of a meaningless command line only useful in Unix. So what this says is, in this case, the plus operator here actually applies to the whole sequence of things before it. So it says take all of these commands here, run them all in a sequence, but don't wait for any of them, and then run this one and wait for it. So what this means is we will basically run ls, uh, we'll start ls and cat at the same time. When ls finishes, it will, will start sleep. When cat finishes, we'll pin out our prompt again. So basically, you can think about these as like operators like uh, multiplication and division. That semicolon has sort of higher precedence than plus. So first, you group things by semicolons. And then you group things by pluses. And you take the things that are separate by pluses and run this as a chunk in the background. Yes? So like another plus here. Uh, so what this would mean is run this chunk uh, and this, and don't wait for either one. Um, so if you think about it, you have a shell. So if we think about the shell command, it's going to run these, it's going to, the shell is going to start these three programs, the ls, sleep, cat, and then whatever you run next. So what it would say is, uh, we will start ls and cat at the same time. We will then, um, when ls is done, we will start sleep. And then we can run the next thing as soon as it becomes available. So we're not waiting. We don't have to wait at all before we start whatever somebody types in next. Hopefully this makes some sense. So the basic... Uh, logic for doing it, the way, the way you have to think about doing this is again using fork and exit. So if you are, suppose, if you have a sequence of commands by semicolons, sort of A, B, and C separated, then what you have is you basically want to have a for loop You want to have a loop that looks like this. Fork, exec, wait, and do this for A, B, and C in order. If you have something like this, uh, then what you would do is you would have the same sequence, but you don't need to wait anymore. Because you're going to run A and not wait, and then run B and not wait, and then run C and not wait. So where it gets complicated, is when you have this mix. Something like this. Um, I should end this with a plus. So here we have A, B, C, plus D, semicolon, E, semicolon, F. So what we want to logically do in this case is we want to do a fork. When we see a plus, we basically want to fork a shell and then use the copy of the shell we've just, run, we've just forked to actually run this whole sequence. So we're basically, when we have a background task, you can think about it as we fork a copy of the shell and that, back, that, that shell is a background task that runs and actually it can wait for things to finish if we wanted to. So here we forked a copy of the shell and that copy of the shell will then do this for loop to actually run each thing separately. So it's a little bit complicated, um, but this is sort of the, the way to think about what happens when you mix these together. So if something ends with a plus, you want to fork a shell to run it separately. If it doesn't end in a plus, you can just run it in a loop um, within your shell. This will make, hopefully will make a little more sense once you start actually thinking about and writing the code. Any questions? It's a little boggling right now. Yes? There should be no way to put um, like the commands in parallel like in parameters 
We're, yeah, we're not dealing, I mean, this is a very limited shell. A real shell has thousands of things in it, and we're cutting it down to a very small number. So we don't have to worry about parens. Um, okay. Yes? Um, what should be the behavior if uh, the end bit plus, instead of a, if that ends with a semicolon? So if it ends with a semicolon, that's a good question. Well, the ending with a semicolon is the same as not ending with anything, because the semicolon separates things and there's nothing after here. So suppose there's nothing at the end here. So what this means is we have one command here that ends with a plus, and one that does not end with a plus. So our rule is if something ends with a plus, we fork a copy of the shell, and then we run through those things. And our rule is if it doesn't end with a plus, then we can just run our loop in our shell in an order, through an order. So we fork a copy of the shell, that copy would run A, B, and C, and then in the master process of the shell, we would run this loop to run D, E, and F. And we would wait for each one. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in this example, you have A semicolon B semicolon C semicolon plus? Um, yeah, that semicolon shouldn't be there. Okay, so no that. semicolon. Um, so if you have a semicolon plus, that basically would mean you have like an empty command here, and it doesn't do anything. Okay. So you just ignore that. So this is sort of running A, B, and C in sequence while you're running D, E, and F in sequence. Yes. Okay. Yes, so you've got two sequences going on at once. Yes? When we're kind of parsing the command line, um, is it just going to look for the first plus? Like so I will get to parsing next, because that's another big challenge. Um, okay, so there's two additional features. So you've got plus, you've got semicolon. There's a couple other things you'll need. So in addition to, so normally what a shell does is it just executes whatever program name you type in. There's also built-in commands that will, um, that the shell will do on its own. So there's a couple of built-in commands. One is exit. Exit will cause the shell to call exit and terminate the shell. Pretty much what you expect. PWD will print the current working directory. There is a system call you can make to learn the current working directory, so you just make that call and print it out. And then CD changes the current working directory. And then there's a system call you can use to sort of change what directory you're working in. So these things are all pretty straightforward, and the thing that's hard is, you know, these look like other commands, so how do they mix with pluses and semicolons and things like that? Um, so if you have a pwd semicolon cd slash user, the rule is the same. You would you're going to have a function in your shell that does pwd prints the working directory. You call that function. When that finishes, you call cd slash user. So what it means here, if you have built-in commands, instead of doing fork exit wait, you might also call a function to do a built-in command. So you'll have a loop to execute commands in order, and each command is either forking or it's calling a built-in function. So it's relatively easy to implement these. What gets a little more complicated is if you have things like So there's a question, we have uh, two commands here that change directory, print the working directory, change the directory, print the working directory. So we have a plus between them, which means we want these both CDs to run at the same time. And that seems kind of crazy. Like, how can you change directory at the same time? So remember, the way that we actually do this is this copy here. We're going to fork a new shell and run these commands in the separate shell. 
<laughs> so this CD here, Changing Directory, only applies really to the things that happen in this copy of the shell. And when anything after this plus basically doesn't see the effect of this changing directory because we didn't wait for it to finish. It's only the things that sort of happen afterwards, sort of things that are done by the same master shell that see the effect of a change directory. So another thing that would be confusing is what if there's an exit here? So we say run exit in the background, what should happen? So there's really two options here. One option is, is that the exit, if you make a copy of the shell here uh, and you call exit in this copy, it only exits sort of this copy of the shell and the master <coughs> copy of the shell is still running. The other alternative, and I think this is what I put in the assignment, is to say that makes no sense. You know, no, no sane person would ever do that. What makes more sense is to say if anybody exits, kill the whole shell. Um, and don't really worry about anything that is after that exit. So I think that's what the assignment says. So basically what happened is over time we didn't say how these things worked and then students tried these things and didn't know what was supposed to happen and so we started adding more and more sort of details on how to handle all these crazy things. Okay, any questions on built-ins? Yes? Um, does the Got it. Excellent question. So if we have a, something like this, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, are these sort of, are these G, H, I sort of children of this one here, or are they something else? Is that your question? Yes. So these are all, these are both sort of subshells of the master shell process. And then these last ones here without a plus would run in the master shell. If I put a plus here, these would also be children. So you'd have your shell, you then have a copy, something like this. So this, this third set does not get nested under the second one. Okay, so the third piece of the shell will be output redirection. And this is a very simple case that says you can take the output of a program and you can send it to a file instead of the screen. That's all you have to implement here. Um, and we're, this time we're just going to stick, this is the normal Unix shell syntax for it. So this is the piece that we have talked, I haven't prepared you at all in any possible way of solving this particular part of the assignment. Right? I've given you no knowledge of how operating systems work to be able to handle this. So I want to spend a little bit um, explaining how this works. Or give you enough understanding. Okay, so we talked about processes, have a process control block. In this process control block is some OS resources. And I keep talking about these as being open files. Well, it turns out this is exactly what they are, and it's called a file descriptor table. And this is just a table indexed by integers. And in this table, there are pointers to the files you have open. So every file you have open shows up in this table. And then if there's nothing open, this table will just be empty. So as a user mode process, you can then operate on these open files. 
And if you, if you looked at the code in dump.c, you notice when you call open, it returns an integer called a file descriptor. I think we use the two-letter acronym FD. When you call open, it will create a new open file, which is just a kernel data structure. It'll put a pointer into this table, and then it will return the index of this table to the program. So usually the first three elements, uh, I think either 0, 1, and 2, are reserved by the operating system. And when you open your first file, it's usually number 3, I believe. It might be number 4. Um, I forget. So when you then want to read from the file, you and you don't say I want to read from this particular file by name. You say I want to read, but from file descriptor four. So you would say read some buffer and some length. The operating system will look at this number you pass in, find it in the table, find the data structure representing the file that says where the data is and it will then return the data from the file. So the idea is this file descriptor is really just an index into a table that tells the OS how to find the actual file data you want. So far, so good. So I said there were three things in the beginning that were reserved. And they are reserved. And these are reserved for what are called standard input. and standard uh, output and standard error. So these are basically sort of pretend files in general. They actually are things that the operating system pretends are files, but they actually go to your terminal screen. So standard input usually goes to your keyboard. So when you, re when you read something from file descriptor zero, it doesn't come from a file, it comes from your keyboard. When you write the file descriptor one, it doesn't go to a file, it goes to your screen. And when you write the file descriptor 2, it also goes to your screen, because standard input and standard error are both sent to your screen. But the nice thing is, even is that, you know, at some point these look just like files, which means that we can actually change uh, what these entries in the table point to and say instead of pointing to keyboard and terminal, we can point these at real files. And that is what input redirection, output redirection does. It basically says. We're going to take this entry here, which all C programs, know, every, every C program knows that file descriptor 1 means standard output. So if we change what file descriptor 1 points to from the terminal to something else, that means the standard output will go someplace else. So I can open a file, and I can replace this, um, and then anything you write will go to the file. So the way this shows up in C is if you use printf, Printf doesn't ask where you want to print things, it prints the standard output. If you call like uh, getchar or scanf, they read from standard input. There's other variations, fprintf, fscanf, they say which file to read from, but the, the printf and scanf versions don't because they're doing standard input and output. So to do output redirection, what you need to do is in your new child process, you basically want to change the standard output file descriptor to point to a file instead of your terminal which is pretty straightforward. Um, okay. So, I said this was easy. How do you actually do it? Well, fortunately, as I said, there's a system call for everything. Sort of. Okay. Um, so, so everything I'm writing here is in the notes that I will post online, and the video will be online. Of uh, the uh, the video of this of the slides will be online. So the first thing you have to do is close the old file descriptor representing standard output. So there's a close command. You may see it's used in generate.c and dump.c. You just call close. At this point, you can't print anything out because there is no standard output. If you called printf, uh, the system might choke on you. The second thing you need to do is you need to open the file that you do want output to go to. Um.
So we open the output file and we need to say that we're only writing to it because output is just writing. We don't need to read from it. So we're going to put the flag O write only. So now uh, we have a file descriptor that points to the file we want. The problem we have is this may not be file descriptor 2. This, I mean, this may not be the file descriptor that we closed. It might be some other file descriptor like 97. So it turns out in older systems, the system would sort of guarantee if you close the file descriptor and then open a file descriptor, it would reuse the, the, the smallest available file descriptor. And so this would sort of almost always redirect standard output for you. But it's not that reliable. So there is a new system call that will basically say, I want to copy this file descriptor into another location in that table. So what this is saying is duplicate the file descriptor, uh, whatever is in the contents of this file descriptor, into this file descriptor here. So in this case, if our file, um, if, our fi if our new file was down here somewhere, uh, we would basically copy this into, uh, look, my arrows are getting crossed here, up here. So both of these, standard output and this file descriptor now point to the same file that we have open. And then when we're done, we can close this file descriptor because we're not using it anymore. So what this does is this says, for the currently running process, we're going to replace standard output with this file named outfile. So the challenge is we don't want to do this for the shell itself. We want to do it for the program we're running. If we do this in the shell process, the shell will start putting output to the file. And that's not what we want to have happen. So we need to think about when we have fork and exec, how do we do this? So the solution is we just put this between the fork and the exec. So what we now have is a sequence that says close the old file descriptor, open the new file descriptor, duplicate it, duplicate the new file descriptor, execute our command, and then if all else fails, we're going to exit and kill this copy. So all we've really done is take this code right here and put it between the fork and the exit. And this says this is how we can change the new process to do something different than what the child parent process did. So we can change where its input or output goes to. Yes? That second close um, execute? Yes, this is this close here. Okay, so we do want to close it before we execute. Um, yes. Yes. So the reason is there are, um, you can get into some troubles because if you leave it, oh, if you leave this open, weird things can happen. Because, uh, which I don't remember the DSLs. I know that students had problems if they didn't close this, bad things happened to their shell. It was kind of a bizarre scenario that took a long time to debug. Okay, so this is how you do it. Yes? So when you close the file descriptor, does the table just automatically point back to the standard output? No, uh, no, when you close it, there is no more standard output. You can't print anything. So you don't want to close it unless you really mean to. So when you're done writing to the file? Well, so in this case, um, so when you are done, so in this case, you're running a whole program with standard output going to a file. When the program exits, it will automatically close everything in this table. So remember how I said when your process exits, the operating system cleans up your PCB, frees your OS resources. The way it frees the OS resources is it walks through this table and effectively calls close on everything that's still in the table. So the OS will do it automatically. Any qu other questions on this? All 
Um, okay. Um, so actually, there's going to be one more tip I'm going to pass along on the shell before we start talking about other things. So this is just something you have to do um, to make the shell work properly. So in the program you're writing right now, probably you do things like You might use printf to print things out. So, remember how I said the way you invoke the operating system is through system calls, which actually trap into the operating system, call a function in the operating system. So under the covers, the system call that is used to print things out is write. Um, and that's why we can do this fancy redirection thing. So printf is actually done with write. What printf does, is it basically is it interprets this this information here, puts it into some buffer of memory, and then passes that buffer of memory um, and it'll pass the buffer and however long this buffer is. So that's how printf works under the covers. Now the problem is the people who wrote printf are pretty smart, and they know that system calls are kind of expensive. Every system call costs maybe 5,000 cycles or something, maybe 1,000, 2,000 cycles. So if you're printing a lot of data, like for example, suppose you are printing out Suppose you have a loop, and inside the loop you're printing out a bunch of integers, and it's only maybe two characters or something. If you make a system call to print this out every time through the loop, it's really slow. So printf is smart, and what it does is it actually builds a buffer in memory. It actually allocates about four kilobytes of, of space in memory, and as you print, call printf, it actually just puts everything into this buffer in memory. And then every once in a while, it will call write on this whole buffer here. This means that when you call printf, it doesn't cause write to happen automatically. Printf puts things in the buffer. At some, every once in a while, printf will actually send the buffer out. Typically, it does this when it sees a new line character, a slash n. Um, but even then, it doesn't necessarily have to print it out. So the problem is, you may be able to anticipate this, is if I then have a fork here, if I do a printf followed by a fork, what happens to this buffer that hasn't been printed yet? Right, it's copied. So now there's a copy of this data in both the parent and the child. So we have two copies of this buffer of things that have to be printed. Um, and so eventually both the parent and the child will print things out. And so you might see messages you print get duplicated once in the parent and once in any child's report. And that makes it really hard to write scripts that automatically check the output when some people's programs have things printed multiple times. The other problem is that what if there's an exec here? An exec will run a new program, but it may not flush this buffer of things that are to be printed yet. So things might never print out at all, if you use printf followed by exit. So use it, the net lesson is using printf with fork and exit is dangerous, uh, and it's fine for testing purposes, but it's not really good if you're writing a real shell. So we need a way to solve this. And basically what you need to do is to do the effect of what printf does on your own. Um, so what you will want to do is create your own buffer to do formatting. Instead of calling printf, you can call sprintf. S means print to a string. Printf means print to standard output. Fprintf is print to a file. Sprintf is print to a string. String. Um, so 
So this will um, put your error into buff. It returns the number of characters that were written into the buffer. Then you can print it out using system calls yourself. So you are basically just decomposing printf yourself into the act of sort of converting whatever you passed with percent signs in it into a single string and then writing it out to a system call. So you will need to do this in your shell to print out error message and other things. Um, the other thing is you'll have to be think about where do you want your output to go to. Typically when you're printing out er errors, you want it to go to standard error. Does anybody know why there's a standard output and a standard error? Yes? You might log the errors to the compile and the output might go to the user. Right. So, so the idea is that, log, you know, really, the idea is the output from a program consists of the real output that you want, which is, you know, the contents of the directory, and then there's the error information, which says it's not running correctly. When you do redirection, you really don't want error messages printed to your file too. You want to know what's in the directory. So if there's any, any errors that happen, you don't, that's not the intent of this command. So the nice thing is you can redirect output, but the errors will still be printed on the terminal screen. So you can see the errors to know that something bad happened while the good stuff goes into the file. Or you can do the reverse, which is send the errors into a file for logging, as you suggested, and then see the good stuff on the screen. But it's just the idea that there's really two streams of information a program produces, the set of errors, the set of good outputs. We want to deal with them separately. By default, they go to the same place because both standard error and standard output go to the terminal screen, but you can separate them and send them different places. So this means you can do things like, uh, uh, well, actually, I'm not going to get into what you can do, but that's why it happens. So I think we are done talking about the shell assignment. Uh, it's probably a little overwhelming at this point. My recommendation is to start small, just do like a simple shell that just handles one command, maybe even a one word command, and then start adding features to it. Uh, because just a simple shell with a one word command will let you test, fork, and exec, and wait. Then you can add multiple commands, which lets you handle passing arguments. Do one thing at a time, get it working, then do the next thing. That's what I recommend. Okay. Where am I on the screen? So I want to now talk a little bit about um, debugging. And I do this because in this program, uh, in C programming, it can be very hard just using print statements to see what's going on. And that's what I find most people do most of the debugging with print statements. Even the grad students I work with, working on the Linux kernel and doing complicated programming, still do most of their debugging with print statements. But it can be difficult to see what's happening. And so I just want to review quickly, and I wish I could show you, um, how to use a debugger. So there's a couple steps. The first step is when you compile your code, include the dash G flag. So I would say GCC dash E, G dash O, V sort, V sort dot C. Dash G says include debugging information. Don't ask me why it's dash G and not dash D, but that was the choice. So Second step is to actually invoke the debugger and say you want to debug your program. In Unix or Linux, you say GDB, GNU debugger is the name of the debugger we all use, and then all you pass is the name of your program, including what directory it's located in. GDB dot slash vsort in this case. See if I 
have a picture of what this looks like. Okay. So this will then produce a prompt. So the problem is you don't get to pass any parameters to your program on this command line. But the nice thing is in the debugger, you can pass parameters. Um, so you would call the set command to say I want to set the arguments, and then you pass in the set of arguments you want to have go to your program. So this is right here is whatever you would normally put on your command line after vsort. And the fourth thing you can do is uh, type in run. And run will just start the program running. If everything works, the program will run, it'll finish, nothing will happen, you will have a, no value from using the debugger. Um, if you have a segmentation fault or some kind of pointer problem, um, If you get a segmentation fault or a pointer fault, this is the beauty of, G, of using a debugger, is the debugger will stop your program right in the line of code where it failed with all the contents of memory, and you can now see where you were and what you were doing. So one useful command is where. Where will print out the stack trace of all the functions that were called to get to where you are, and it'll print out the arguments to all those functions, so you can see where you are in your code. If you just have a main function, this is pretty useless because you'll always be in your main function. But if you have more than one function, this can help. List will list the code around where you stopped running. You can also type in the line number of the code in your file to debug. So you can say list 22. It'll start listing the code starting at line 22. You can say uh, list main, and it'll list the code for main.c and show you what's in the code. So this lets you look at your code. You can say print, and then you can pass a variable name. You can say print rec, and you can print out what's in the record. And the nice thing is, is that it actually understands C. So if you have an array, you can say print variable of 10 dot value. So, you know, a standard expression of how you access a structure and array works inside GDB. So this is very nice for printing out complex data structures because you can see exactly what's in there. So this lets you see when you crash, you can print out the values of all the variables and see, oh, what has the wrong value right now? So this works well if you crash, but if the program just doesn't work but isn't crashing, this isn't very helpful. So there, you can also say run until you get to a particular place in the code. Uh, and you do that by saying break. Break will set a break point, which means run here and then stop. Give the command prompt, the GDB prompt, where you can type in these commands. Um, and you can set a breakpoint on a line number or a function name. You can say break main, the break right when you get into main. You can say break 22, stops on line 22. Cont means continue after you've broken. If you want to keep going, typing cont allows you to keep going. So you can see things are working now. Let's stop again later. Um, so this is good for sort of looking at what's happening. If you want to walk through your code one line at a time, so next we'll execute the next line of code in the function that you're in. If there's any function calls, it will sort of skip over them. It doesn't go into the function that you called. It always stays in the function that you're in. So step is like next, but if you're at a function call, it'll actually step into the function you're calling. 
So if you're in main and you're calling open and you had code for open, it would jump into open. Step will, anything that is part of a, that a C library function, step will skip over. It only steps into things that are part of your program that you can actually debug. Finish says keep running until this function is over and you're about to return to the function you came from. So if you've gotten a function, you don't care what happens, you can type finish, and that will take you to the end of the function. So this is a nice way, you know, if, you're, um, if your program is printing out an error message in some place, you don't know why it's printing an error, you can put a breakpoint in that line of code, and then you can look at all the variables to see what is actually happening. Um, if a function is returning a value, you know, if you didn't print out the value of a function return and you want to know what it is, you can use these commands to print out what a function returns to see why it's failing or what error code happened. So this is a really nice way to, particularly for C code, to sort of figure out what's going on. Um, particular sort of when you get a seg fault, this is sort of tells you why, where you're getting the seg fault. Yes? Can I have multiple breakpoints? Yes, you can have lots and lots of breakpoints. So how to navigate between two breakpoints? Um, so you, so, if you stop at a breakpoint and say continue, the program will just keep running until it gets to another breakpoint. And then you can say continue, it keeps running until it gets to another breakpoint. So um, there's a variation which is T break, which says put a breakpoint, but then re remove the breakpoint as soon as you stop. So it only stops once. So if you have a loop, it'll start to stop the first time, but not any other time. Yes? When do you run the breakpoint command? So usually what I do is I would run break right here. I put a breakpoint um, before I type run. The other thing you can do is you can type control C, it'll break in, then it'll give you the command prompt and you can see where in the code you are. So if you feel like your sort program is running too long and you want to know what it's doing, like it's an infinite loop, you can break in and then start stepping through the code one line at a time. Okay, so there's about two minutes left. There's one more thing I want to tell you about. Um, and uh, this will hopefully, if you use it, not many students actually get around to using it, but those who do think it's a great idea. So I'm gonna show you some sample code. Um, Okay, so suppose I have some code where I allocate to memory with malloc, I print something into it with sprintf here, I then free the memory I allocated, but then I print out the variable x afterwards. So first of all, what is the problem with this code? The problem with this code is that I freed the memory in x and then I'm using it after I freed it. And as I said, nothing stops you from doing this, but It'll fail sometimes, but, and it'll fail sometimes, but not always. So it'll be maddeningly difficult to debug why it went wrong. So there is a tool that will find this kind of bug for you. And it's free. It was a research project, and it's called Valgrind. And you can download it and install it on your own computer. Um, I think it is already on the computers in the department. Um, so with Valgrind, uh, again, you just compile things the normal way. This time, you invoke it by saying Valgrind. And you pass the whole command line to it. So you're passing the entire command line as an argument to Valgrind. Valgrind will run your program and as your program runs it'll say, do you ever use memory that you didn't allocate? Or use memory after you called free on it? Or if you had an array that was 10 elements, do you ever access more than 10 elements of the array? 
So anything you can do wrong with memory, the algorithm will try to detect, and it will tell you. And so what it will print out is something like, you know, if you ran it here, it would say on line four of your program, you're using this address that was freed on line three. And it will tell you that there's a bug on line four, and you're accessing the memory and where you freed it previously. So it'll tell you exactly what's wrong in your code. So if you have weird memory problems, if your program gets seg fault and you don't know why, try Valgrind because it can tell you what's going wrong. Uh, so I'm going to stop here for today. Uh, I have office hours for the next hour or so. If you have questions, I can take them now. You can walk back with me, come to my office later. Very quick question about my program.